Hi, I'm Nick Schultz. I'm the editor of American.com. My guest today is Jonah Goldberg. Jonah, welcome. It's good to have you here. It's great to be here. Jonah is uh, the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Liberal Fascism. He is editor-at-large at National Review Magazine, a columnist, a nationally syndicated columnist, uh, whose column appears in dozens of newspapers around the country. Um, he is also the editor of a brand new book, which is what we're here to talk about. The book is called Proud to be Right, uh, Voices of the Next Conservative Generation. Jonah, it's good to have you here. Um, tell me a little bit about this, this book and how you came to be involved in this project. You, you edited the book, so it's a volume with essays from a number of different writers. So tell me about it and your involvement. Sure. Uh, first of all, it's great to be here. Um, uh, you left out that I started my career at the American Enterprise Institute, and now it looks like I'm finishing it here. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I, I worked on the book with Adam Bellow, who was my editor when he was at Random House and I was working on liberal fascism. And uh, we had been talking about how we didn't really know who the next wave of people like you and me are, who the next conservative youngins in their 20s and maybe even their late teens or very early 30s um, the next generation of, of conservative writers and intellectuals and activists and all the rest. And I'll, I'll confess that Adam had a selfish interest in it is because he wanted to look for the next generation of authors that he might be able to work with someday. And me as a guy at National Review and all the rest, I wanted to know who these people were too. And, and, so, and for those who, who don't know Adam Bellow, uh, is a... Is Adam Bellow is one of the foremost publishers in New York, an editor. He's worked on... Uh, everything from The Bell Curve by Charles Murray at AEI to scores of other uh, books. And he's actually just started his own imprint out of HarperCollins. And this is the publisher of this is HarperCollins. So anyway, uh, we wanted to sort of uh, look where the fish were and go find these young conservative writers and see what they had to say and see how they differed from maybe previous generations. And that was the basic idea of the book. The only rule I had, there were only basically two rules. One is uh, the contributors had to be younger than me. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're older than me, you're no longer young. And um, two, I didn't want it to be a one-size-fits-all, cookie-cutter kind of approach to conservatism. You know, if you go by the mainstream media's depiction of conservatives, uh, it's this undifferentiated blob of uh, automatons, all of whom are uh, two eye holes in a pillowcase from being Klansmen. And um, the reality is, as anybody who's worked at places like National Review or the American Enterprise Institute, is there is a remarkable intellectual and ideological diversity on the right. And I wanted to show that off. So some of the essays in there I love, some I disagree with, some I love and disagree with. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea was to sort of show, not tell, about how this is a much more complicated generation. Okay, I, wa I want to come back to that in, in just a minute. But the um, you write uh, uh, a nice introduction at the, at the beginning of it. And in that introduction, you compare uh, young conservatives to blacks, Canadians and Jews. That's right. Explain that. Uh, yeah, now this has been a big thing of mine for years is, you know, uh, you know there's a reason why uh, blacks, Canadians, and Jews basically dominate the world of comedy. Uh, they, uh, if, you, if you took all the blacks, Canadians, and Jews, um, and gays, let's say, out of comedy, um, it would basically be a couple misanthropic old waspy guys, right? Um, and one of the reasons why uh, they dominate comedy is because they are insider outsiders. They live within the mainstream culture, but they're also sort of pressed up against it, slightly alienated from it. Uh, you listen to all of these Canadians who grew up watching American television, um, you know, Michael Myers on down, you know, uh, watching American television, sort of studying American popular culture, but not being part of it and they have this kind of visitor from Mars ability to comment on it. Same thing with blacks and Jews. They are part of mainstream American culture, but they also have their own subculture. And the same thing works that way on college campuses. Uh, young conservatives have to master mainstream culture. They're part of mainstream culture. They're Americans. Um, they have to study the course load that they're given to pass their classes and the rest. But they also, if they want to be conservatives, they have to read all this other stuff. They have to read on their own time National Review or Tom Sowell or Charles Murray because they're certainly not going to get it in their classes. And so in some ways they develop this whole other understanding of the mainstream culture and of the society they live in 
that some liberal kids who may be very, very smart and well-read don't have because there's not that level of alienation and distance from mainstream culture. They are mainstream culture. The, um, uh, I've, you compare them to, to, to comedians, and I, I wonder if you find that there's more humor on the right uh, than there is, say, uh, on the left in part because of that. Not that, that conservatives make the, the, the funniest people, but do you find that in these writings or, or in general? I think there's a lot to that, and every now and then this subject comes up about why are conservatives, conservative writers funnier than liberal writers. When you, when most comedians and actor funny actors tend to be liberals, why is it among conservatives people like David Brooks, P.J. O'Rourke, Chris Buckley, um, to me when I've you know eaten some bad clams, and uh, the I think part of it is this alienation thing is we have this ability to look from with outside the culture and criticize it in a way. Also, I think there is something uh, almost metaphysical or ineffable about the nature of liberalism and that is coalitional. Um, you know, I, I often like to joke that um, the forces of political correctness are really the coalition of the oppressed. And there's a problem with um, liberal political commentary and, and polemical stuff, especially like when they try to do Air America, the talk radio thing, is that the vast majority of comedic material is just denied liberals because it's mean, right? It's mean to pick on these people or those people. So the only people that they can pick on are old, rich, white guys um, and Christian fundamentalists. And even if you're really funny about that, eventually that material just gets old, right? Um, and, and yet they're constantly talking about American conservatives as if we're all a bunch of characters out of some Thomas Nast cartoon. Um, and meanwhile, conservatism, because it is sort of outside all those relationships, it has just a lot more material to work with to make fun of.